Well, hello, you four. Welcome back to more Bibliophiles. It's season two. Today's episode is entitled Little Women, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which is I love it. another famous movie. Wow, I was really expecting kind of a chuckle out of that, but no chuckles. That's all right. I chuckled. Right. Didn't you hear my chuckle? Moving on. Um, no, I want to ask you guys a question first, though, and it just occurred to me before we got on the air, and I was so excited to ask it of you. Um, beginning with the youngest person in the room and ending with the oldest. I feel singled out right I now, would like okay. to know. I would like to know what your first memory of seeing a movie is. Mm. Ooh. Your very first conscious memory of watching a movie. Okay. Okay. Starting with me then, right? As Starting the youngest. With you, Megan. Um, I can't remember. It's a toss up between two. I think that it was a cartoon Winnie the Pooh with the, the blustery day, Winnie the Pooh and the blustery day. I think that's the first one that I remember. It could be either that one or in my mind, it's connected to the Disney Peter Pan. Hmm. Ooh, I like that. And what is, what is your impression of that moment? Is it warm and fuzzy? Oh, how could Winnie the Pooh and the blustery day not be warm and fuzzy? I mean, it was delightful. <laughs> you never look at an autumn leaf the same way again. <laughs> that's great. I love it. Uh, uh, mine, although I know that this isn't technically chronologically true, I don't think. But my first memory of going to the movies is Anastasia, which I saw in theaters with mom and was totally overjoyed by. Wait, I think I misunderstood this question. Do you mean your first experience going to the movies? I mean, the, the first the first conscious moment that you have oh. that's a memory of seeing a movie. It doesn't have to be at the theater. That oh, just okay, happens great. to be my version of it. So my baby Ian went to, the to see Anastasia in the theaters. Were you yeah. terrified? <laughs> I don't remember terror, but I do. I mean, Somebody Rasputin probably owed you an real. apology for that. Yeah, it's no, probably no. me. Anastasia was great. Yeah. Um, I thought your first movie experience was Babe. I, I think you're right. That's why I said it's not chronologically true that Anastasia was my first. But I don't remember seeing Babe in the theater. So well, I, do remember I remember you seeing Babe. And I also remember what you said to dad when we got home. What did oh, he yeah. say, remember? He said, dad, we saw a movie today. It was about babes. <laughs> that uh, about yes. right. <laughs> Priceless. He was Ian from the cradle, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Emily. Oh, my memory is so terrible, but I want to say, okay. My fear, my first movie related memory has to do with getting a toy story like Happy Meal toy from McDonald's oh. and being excited. And I think it was a puppet of the dinosaur mm -hmm. and then like seeing Toy Story and being really excited about having the puppet. That's, I think, my first conscious movie related memory. Toy Story. Wow. Toy Story. Classic. That's a good one. Generation That's a classic. Classic. thing. You really can't argue with that. Doesn't seem like that was that long I ago, know. does it? I was a grown up. <laughs> It's very no. weird. It might have been. Hold on, I might need to. Well, it's your memory, it's Emily. Answer. It doesn't. You, you don't have to edit. You want. It. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm afraid There's no to check the here. release date on Toy Story. It might be that it was. The I was second. eleven. Emily can't remember anything I, before the age of twelve. I, <laughs> <laughs> kind of true. Uh, so yeah, mine was the. the I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Emily. I'm, I interrupted you. I'm too eager to talk about my movie experience. Chad, you can cut all of this out. <laughs> but it had to have been the second Toy Story because I was only four when the first one came out. Yeah, that's right. You can remember things from when you were four. <laughs> you can remember things from like before you were one. This is a debate that happens <laughs> in my household. Okay, before which one of you one. goes next? I, do I go next. You're going youngest, oldest, right? I'm the yeah, oldest. Mom's the oldest. Okay. Life. Oh, wow. My earliest memory is uh, Walt Disney's animated The Jungle Book. Oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. But I can't remember if that's earlier than Walt Disney's The Love Bug. Oh, oh The Love Bug. Too. I love Just that a live movie. action movie about the Volkswagen Beetle with a heart who gets yes. involved in rally road races against evil uh, antagonists and got all of us hooked on Beatles. car racing on car mm -hmm. racing is that the one where he ends up eventually with giant wooden wagon wheels instead of tires 
like I remember across that. the finish line. All I remember is all of the drivers wore these stupid little tight fitting helmets <laughs> with uh, little snaps across the place where the <laughs> visor snaps in, except nobody was wearing a visor. So they just had these little snaps across their forehead. <laughs> <laughs> As though a helmet you was remember be that. much protection. <laughs> they must be driving slow enough that a crash was really more of an inconvenience than a Oh, no, no, they, they <laughs> sped the film up. They were hauling butt. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Okay, last but not least, mom, what's your what's your first movie memory? Okay, so it's a it's kind of a, a toss up. I can't quite remember which came first, but I remember being taken to a movie that was not a kids movie, but I was just sort of taken with my parents because they didn't think I was paying attention yet. Is this going to be a sad Big story? Mistake. Yeah, I feel like this is going to be sad. <laughs> she can I make do anything sad. Some sort of a fiery <laughs> crash on the screen that I go. found terrifying. <laughs> and we left the theater. <laughs> so, Fear and Terror is your first movie memory. It was. But I. I it was. Actually, yeah. the other one, it wasn't really any better. It was um, Dr. Seuss's The Lorax. Oh, right? no. oh no! I speak for the trees. That one, you know, the little environmental yes. diatribe, and it just uh, with the barbel loops and the little strings. Yeah, barbel loops, barbel loops suits. in there. Barbel yeah. suits. We're having to like relocate, and they were all so sad, and I cried so hard. My mom had to leave the movie theater with me. Wept, so my wept first for the two movie memories American. were abortive. Oh, <laughs> And she's been walking out of the movies ever since. She's been walking oh, yeah. out of the This is when she, she went home and she took refuge in a book and she decided the printed page is superior to the yep. screen. This is a sensitive child, what can I say? <laughs> oh, that delivered that that delivered exactly what I was hoping it would. That was really Good question. Fun. Yeah. Really fun. fun. Okay. Well, so to, to get back on topic, we are discussing the first. Well, we're I guess we're together shooting a volley, our first volley in the discussion of literary adaptations for the screen mm. and Megan you are in the hot seat today because it is your recommendation that we discuss the un what is it a, is it a holy or an unholy trinity of movie adaptations of little women oh I think definitely a holy one and a I'll go trinity. I'll go into all my details yeah okay okay well take us take it away from there um what is your impression of these three adaptations well, I have a soft place in my heart for Louisa May Alcott. I think that most young girls do. Um, little Women is a book for little women. And so every mother gives their daughter this book when she's coming along as kind of the archetype uh, coming of age story for a young woman. And mom did that for me. We had a class on it and talked about all the themes. And then we watched every single version of this that we could get our hands on, mostly because of one, one principle, the atmosphere of this story is magical. It's warm and inviting. It's like a fireside scene of convivial, uh, sisterly and motherly affection. And right. so who doesn't want to live in that world? right? The moment you realize this is a thing, you want to live there with the March family and be a March yourself. And it's just delightful. And before you really have the ability to look deeper than that, already the atmosphere of the story has welcomed you in. So from a young age, I watched all the ones that I could get my hands on, all the, the movie adaptations of this glorious novel. Now, how many and of them did I, you, what, was, what yeah. was the number at that point? At that point, I found three, and I know that there are more than that, but there are three that stand out as, um, well, not all of them I watched back in the day. One of them I watched recently, but there were two when I was a kid, and then now there's been a recent remake uh, by, by Greta Gerwig that is absolutely fantastic. So there were two when I was a kid vying for first place. So it would have been, what, 19, the 1949 and then the 1994? Yeah. So the 1949 versions. version is the one with Elizabeth Taylor and June Allison nice. and um, Janet Lee as well from Psycho. Um, wow. There's a, so there's a cast list for you. It really is. It's a star studded cast and really well acted, but um, antiquated, you know, from the 1940s. Dare we say um, sappy. Well, black and white, right. And not black and white. It's color, but I think it's technicolor okay, and you can okay. tell. Yeah. So I think that one, I've got all kinds of opinions, but that one I loved. Um, then it was remade in 1994 and that's the Christian Bale and Winona Ryder. Um, I think it's Susan Sarandon is Marmy in that one. And, well, I have Dunst memories of that one because Amy. at one point we were all in the basement doing our thing, choosing movies at grandma's house. Yeah. And somehow you won the lottery, which we boys um, generally 
found a way thank to you win. for admitting somehow, that in public i appreciate we that. somehow <laughs> found a way to win because we didn't want to watch whatever schmarm you wanted to put up on the screen no, uh, I it. but we lost that day and we all had to sit and i remember grandma it was so funny she must have thought this was hilarious she was very stern in the moment <laughs> but then she went upstairs and laughed to herself i'm sure because she wouldn't let the boys go play outside we wanted to like rage quit having <laughs> lost the battle <laughs> <laughs> go outside and climb a tree and she was like no 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 you have to sit here and watch the movie because megan and molly kate won and this is how it's gonna go so there's only two through, of them and only four women. of you yeah. yeah and honestly i kind of liked it <laughs> well i'm glad to hear you say that it was go ahead okay. emily i'm sure you're gonna bring this up but that one has the eternal question of why in the world Winona Ryder turned to Christian Bale at the oh, height dude. of his powers down. <laughs> I know he was such a foxy fox. The reason Molly and I wanted to watch it was not for any I Christian moral reason. It was that Christian Bale was hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, old little old little oh, oh who pat. cares? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh no, they awesome. were, they were great. But I thought that the assignment today was to kind of give you uh, which one I thought was good, which one was better and which one was best. So I know the title of our episode today is, is good, funny, bad and the ugly. good, bad and the ugly, but I actually want to lay it out there. Cause I know that women feel strongly about this. I don't think any of those three versions I've just mentioned are bad. I think they awesome. all have things to recommend them, but I do have a favorite. So Okay, sweet. Well, start, I guess, start with good and then go to better and best, but do keep in mind those categories yeah. we were talking about. I mean, I'm interested to know what you think in terms of what kind of an adaptation this is, what the director was really after, sure. what he focused on in these different versions. Absolutely. Well, I think the, uh, the solid, good, good version is the 1994 with Winona Ryder and uh, Christian Bale. I think that some people may quibble with that. They might put that as the as the best option. I know that it's many of your favorite version, or at least it was until recently. Um, but I think that it's just good. And here's why it is a straight ahead scene for scene recap of the book. It takes into account the thematic heft of the novel and emphasizes in particular, the, uh, the wistfulness and the nostalgia of a childhood mm. that's fading, mm -hmm. um, exchanging, uh, womanly things for childhood scenes and the bittersweet elements of that. I think that it is really strong directorially speaking on the music that really mm. emphasizes and heightens that atmosphere. And all of the performances of the actors and actresses are quintessentially clearly connected to the book. So I thought the director read the book and said, that was great. No change is necessary. Let's go scene for scene. Let's just and as a result, it's iconic. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost, I mean, it's a little bit like Anne of Green Gables, like mom was saying in our previous episode, it's word for word, scene for scene, lovely, uh, but you don't have to read the book after seeing that movie. Huh. All right. Well, yeah, then I, I feel a shade less guilty for not having read it Yeah. myself. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, mom. I was going to say the thing I remember best about that particular version of the movie was the soundtrack. I thought the score was fabulous in that yeah. movie. Yeah, I agree with yeah, that. Yeah, the music. Absolutely. I think it's Thomas Newman. And yes, it's I think absolutely right. magical. Oh, Thomas Newman. Boy, he hasn't written a bad score that I know of. What I remember about that movie is Christopher Columbus, we're betrayed. That's what I remember. <laughs> In fact, Ian, that is not that movie. Is that, that the wrong is, one? That is the older one. That's from 1949. And it You're is June me. Allison's version. And that's the reason that June Allison's version falls uh, even better in my estimation. She is you mean such to tell me a I have wonderful seen two? Joe. I saw both of, I've seen three. <laughs> you did. Little women adaptations. I won more often than I'm admitting in the little movie game. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I always watch a lot little of women. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I think, yeah, I think the 1949 version is even better in my estimation because of, like we were saying yesterday, one of the things that makes a movie remake good is that it sees the spirit of the novel mm -hmm. and then gets into conversation with it. And I think that um, when it comes to atmosphere, one of the things about Alcott's novel is it's a little bit didactic. It's a fireside, it's a fireside story that you read to little girls calling them up to be good women eventually. And so it's a little heavy handed even. Yeah, yeah. Parts, Agreed. Right. 
And when you read it, if you read it too late in life, you think, well, stop preaching at me. I know how to be a woman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or if you're a man, you think I'm not the target audience of this book. Right. And you put <laughs> you exactly. Think, this book isn't for me. What am I doing in here? No, <laughs> but I think that the, um, something about the tone of an old movie is a little didactic anyway. It's, it's wow. a little bit closer to a stage play in some ways, the way that they set up the scenes that characters walk in and out of and the camera doesn't move as much. Um, mm. the, the way that they talk is a little bit more old fashioned. It was suited to an old fashioned kind of story that was gonna have traditional themes at its heart. That makes sense. Hmm. So I thought it, it wasn't even on purpose on the part of the director, but he, he nailed it. It was a good moment to make that movie, I guess. Right. It was the right time for it. So, but it was, it was also a scene for scene, line for line retelling. Yeah, it was for the most part. I don't think she made, I don't think that director made any dramatic alterations to the structure of the plot line in particular. Mm -hmm. There may have been um, differentiations in the, the scripts. I know that the 1994 version um, modernized some things. Um, right. Joe's character in particular is much more uh, forward thinking. She has a conversation with the men when she goes to New York mm -hmm. about transcendentalism. And you can hear the director um, interacting not only with Alcott's novel, but with Alcott's context, her own her family. Yeah, yeah right addressing on. the fact that her father was a transcendentalist and that they as a family suffered quite a bit, actually trying to practice transcendentalism, to put that into practice and differentiate themselves from the, the everyday Christian. Um, so it's a little bit more, the 94 version is a little bit more um, in conversation with a larger uh, worldview, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. So, I thought it was cool. So that's good. That's good and better. Let's talk about <laughs> best. Oh man. Well, I think you all have seen Greta Gerwig's, uh, newest articulation of the storyline. It was in 2019 that she, uh, released little women again with a star studded cast. Saoirse Ronan plays Joe, Timothy Chalamet, who is the it guy of Hollywood right now, <laughs> plays Laurie, which might be the best casting of all time. The guy looks like a 12 year old, even he when does. he's supposed to be a man, yep. um, which really works for reasons that I hope we go into. Um, <laughs> it <laughs> works, works in the character so, so much. We into. <laughs> well, no, because Laurie is kind of, um, I don't know, he's boyish to the end of this story. And there's something about his character that isn't ever supposed to grow up. It's a little bit Peter Pan-y right. um, because that's, that's the nostalgia of the piece is that he is a, a piece of her childhood, you know? Right. I get it. So I, I, yeah, that's beautiful. So let me ask you guys sort of yeah. in turn, when you heard that there was another Little Women movie in the works, what was your instinctive gut level reaction? Dad, why? <laughs> Emily? Yeah. I was excited about the cast. But that's after you learn the cast, though. Mm -hmm. Just the idea well, of a Little Women movie coming again. I learned them together. Okay, all right. But <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Mom, what did you think? Well, my thought was, how could they do it better than they had last time? Right. Okay. I, I mean, I mentioned that score. It was fantastic. But I thought that the entire film was really well done. The second so time. you said your response was why also, except yeah. with an additional positive spin of why I loved the last one so much. Well, I thought, wow, that they're really, they've got a, a high bar set for them. They're going to have right. to really jump high to get over it. My reaction lacked that positive spin. I just thought, well, that box has been checked already several well, times. <laughs> I actually think, I think that's kind of fun, actually, because um, the Greta Gerwig version seemed to be uh, drawing the pale a little bit broader than the previous articulations of the story and trying to welcome in not only women, but also men into this conversation. Yep. Can, for me. To be, Can confirm. Can yeah. confirm. Yeah. Absolutely. Did it work for you guys? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I think I know how she did it and I'm excited to, to talk about it. One of the things I think is that well, particularly here, we really value deep, many faceted stories. And I'm going to say something really controversial. I don't think Little Women, as Louisa May Alcott wrote it, is a deep, many faceted story. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't. Me either. Anyone who's I ever tried to teach the book has to agree with you. They have yeah. to. Oof. It's saying one thing, and it's saying it very, um, very straightforwardly, uh, lacking a lot of subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> and though it is warm and fuzzy and comforting and nostalgic, it is not deep and thought provoking and 
You know what I mean? And I think oh, I will Jesus also say enjoyed. that it's profound. Yeah, it is profound. Yeah, it I is think profound. I agree with you. Profound, but it's not deep. I like um, what Emily just said. It's human it's, and moving. It's maybe just made yeah. to be enjoyed. Mm-hmm. I think so. It really intended to cause a lot of deep ruminations, maybe. Yes. Yeah. And I think Greta Gerwig saw that story, loved it, res- first and foremost, respected what Louisa May Alcott was doing and, and what it has done in the hearts of women for a long, long time. And then said, I think we need to fix a couple things in order to set these characters free. Mm. All of them have potential to be living, breathing characters, but the way that Louisa May Alcott drew them um, is, is shallow. It's one dimensional. They're, They're flat. So, okay. Mm-hmm. So what you said, I want to stop you for a second, because you yeah. said that, um, that she respected what Louisa May Alcott was after what she was doing and the experience that women upon women upon women over the years have had with the book. What yeah. struck me when I was watching it is that um, the experience that this book has caused is out of step, is deeper mm. than the book itself. Yes. For a lot of people. And I, it struck me that maybe one of the things that sets this adaptation apart was the fact that it was made with an eye to that rather than made to reproduce the book scene for scene. It was trying to produce instead the experience that people have had reading this beloved. Interesting. Story. I think so. I love that. That definitely ties into the character deepening that you see. She projects a possible reason for each character to behave Mm. the way that they do. And Alcott didn't do that. She didn't explain why Meg is constantly mooning about being poor when it doesn't seem to bother the rest of her sisters. Also, Um, there's finally a reason for her to marry a poor guy because it's James Norton instead of that Right. Really guy from the 1994 <laughs> version. You're so right. There's finally a reason I'm for just her head to return. Superficial comments. James <laughs> Norton's going to make more than one appearance on this podcast is all I have to say. It sure is. Man, what a hunk. <laughs> <laughs> that giggle, Ooh, is it that hot in here? <laughs> that giggle was perfect. Uh-huh. Die right now. Megan, it, Megan, say more. Say more. It now. Well, I was just, I'm just thinking through, I love that idea that Greta Gerwig um, projected for us all of our assumptions about why these characters might be the way that they are. And in so doing, deepened them. She projected a conflict onto each character and you can identify it. For Meg, it's poverty versus love. Mm-hmm. And, the, and in the, the fight between those two things, love wins every time and there's gonna be hardship in it and she lets you see it. She gives you individual conversations between Meg and John Brooks after they're married to show how it goes and whether that choice was a good one and whether it will bring her joy in her future life. And that's a whole, um, there's character development there that the other movie versions and the book itself never touched on, hmm. right? She kind of gets married and then she disappears. Um, for Beth, there's also a conflict. She's uh, battling loneliness versus contentment at home. And um, in the older versions, there's this line, Beth says something to the effect of, I never had a dream like any of you guys to go out beyond the fireplace. So I guess that I was meant to die. I guess (laughs) I'll just stay here then and die young. I know. I mean, that's a really shallow thing to say. Nobody ever really says that. Oh my God. It's also terrifying. If you ever find yourself without a dream, you're like, oh no. Oh no. Maybe Maybe I'm going to die of terror. (laughs) (laughs) I'm without a dream. I guess I'll just stay here then and die young. You know, like, whoa. But no, she deepens, again, Gerwig deepens that character. And there are many scenes where Beth's purpose in the story is actually found at home. She deepens the home space by bringing all of herself and all of her gifts and all of her perceptions of her sisters to bear on that little world. It's not invalid just because it's little. And she lets that be a conversation in the story. She does this with every single character. But one of the things, before I talk about the other characters, I think that in particular, in setting all these characters free, she realized a problem with Alcott's story, and it was a problem of organization. Mm. Alcott's story has always been told in a linear fashion, chronologically from the beginning when they're really, really young to the end of the story when they're all happily married and or dead, moving on. And or right? dead. <laughs> so why right. would Joe go with middle-aged Professor well, Bear when she could have had Christian Bale? Yes, it's a problem, you guys. <laughs> she, you never get to see... Her. Well, I don't think, I actually think this is funny and you can laugh, but I also think that 
a gener generations of women will never forgive her for Joe not marrying Lori. You spend right. all of the time investing in young Joe and young Lori growing up together. Who doesn't love a story like that? See Anne, Anne Shirley and Gilbert Blythe. Right. You watch yeah. them drive each other nuts and fall in love with one another. And when Anne Shirley tells Gilbert Blythe, no, everyone throws the book out the window. It's what you do, right? right. And in that story, Lucy Maud Montgomery or whatever her name is said, I know, I know. Don't worry, I don't mean I'm coming it. Back We're circling around. back around. We have again. to get it. We have to get to Anne of South Africa before we can really wrap this up. <laughs> exactly. She goes, wait till Anne's in the universe, and then we'll bring that we'll back around. There. We'll get there. Little concentric no. circles moving ever outward. Right. <laughs> yes, Alcott doesn't do that. She doesn't circle back around uh, in the book, and I think that generations of women have been absolutely. I mean, they've been pissed about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you think maybe the director of this new, this new version is one of those women? Oh, I really do. Yeah. I do. Yes. Because I think, I don't know. I understand what Alcott was doing thematically in not letting Joe marry Lori. I think she was right, but we hated her for it. Yeah. And I think Gerwig looks at Alcott and says, sister, I know what you're doing and there's a way to fix this. What we need is to see Joe with Professor Bear first. We need to see mature Joe in process being a woman already and have the childhood romance that she rejected as just a childhood romance hearkened back to every once in a while when she's insecure. That's how we need to see this story because that's the story you meant to tell. Mm -hmm. Here's Joe as a woman falling in love for real. Joe in the past wasn't, didn't know anything about love and neither did Lori. And we need to have that in its rightful place. And as a result, we got to put it second. We got to see that second chronologically in the same way. She takes Amy, the Amy Lori thing has always been creepy. Mm -hmm. I don't yes. know if you guys agree with that, but I've always known that I yeah. would marry. Well, it's March. not even, see, it's I not even from knew. the Amy side Ew. for me. It's from the Lori side. Like what yes. didn't get the, didn't get the one. There's another March sister. Might exactly. as well. And, and in me. fact, Worse than that, there's only one left because Beth just died. So better snap up Amy. I mean, <laughs> We're for running real. Out of options here. Yeah. It came across as a little bit uh, sudden, hasty, creepy in the worst sense, impersonal in the best sense, right? right. It wasn't about Amy. Yeah. I think that I've got all kinds of reasons that I think I think that Greta Gerwig is awesome, but Amy is the main one. I think that she saw Amy's character and she thought, I don't think Alcott liked her very much. Mm -hmm. I don't think Alcott liked the character of Amy. And so she's never anything but annoying. She's never anything yep. but a drag on Joe's ticket. And then she gets Lori in the end. And that's why we hate her. <laughs> that's why we hate her. <laughs> when you read it in your head, her voice is up here and she kisses yes. out her nose. So then Gerwig got Florence yeah. Pugh, whose voice, whose voice is deeper than here. mine. Florence Which... Pugh's voice is deeper than mine. That really caused a lot of furor, actually. People oh, said she, her it. voice sounds too mature. She can't play this little girl. But notice again, the, the chronology is what Greta Gerwig changes. We see Amy first as an adult off on the Europe trip with Aunt March. And there as an adult, we see her run into Lori and they have a really natural bond of affection from years past growing up as children together, but they're not children when we see them. And so their relationship begins on the footing of adults mm. and all of the water under the bridge only it's only hinted at and it deepens their connection off in a foreign land with only the two of them for company it's also who says she again. can't play a little kid because that was stinking hilarious <laughs> oh every time she, she stepped great. on screen she lit it completely up she so really good. did her performance was excellent but i think just to get back around to the conversation about directorial choices and um, film adaptations of books, there are two scenes in particular that Greta Gerwig inserted into the story that um, one of them has, has words, and I'll talk about it in a moment, but the other one is just a passing scene. It's just a visual element that I think are her autobiographical notes inserted into the story. One of them, Joe is writing her novel at the end after Beth has died and all kinds of stuff has gone down. And she's, she's furiously writing. It's a, it's a writing montage, something that no one in real life experiences. We have like, you know, writer's block. Writer's and, block, and, yeah. yes, <laughs> writing montage, no, Agony, not so much. Writing montage where, where paper is just flying, you know, like the, <laughs> the story is being written before your very eyes. Well, Joe's having a moment like that. And there's a scene in the attic, her childhood attic, where the papers are all light out and uh, lane, late, light, light, 
Lay out. Thank you. Laid out, laid out. Oh, that's Lou. <laughs> nah, that can't be it. That. Um, <laughs> they're all laid out on the floor and organized. And Joe is standing over them and reorganizing the papers. She's moving mm. the piles around. And it seems to me as I watched the movie that this is Greta Gerwig's project. She saw the story and she said, all good, all good bones, all good elements. If we just <laughs> take this episode over here and we move this one over here, watch and see how the characters come to life. Look why you love this story. I will show you. I will show wow, you. Wow, that is different. really compelling. She did things like in the reorganization process, she took Beth's death and made it the climax. But she emphasized that there was a, a matching scene, a foil scene earlier in the story when Beth is sick and she doesn't die. Mm -hmm. And she uses those two stories to basically tell you two halves to go back and forth between, um, between modern day for Joe Grown up Joe and young kid Joe circling around those two conflicts with Beth. Um, I thought that was so, so powerfully done. And, and to a purpose, there was a theme behind it. She basically said the first time when Joe was a kid, when Beth got sick, Joe's response was to say, God has not met my will. And I, when I say you get better, you get better. And she does. Beth does get better. In the eyes of a child, my will is ultimate. And I will bring to pass what should be. And there's a, a light, rosy glow. The, um, the costuming and the lighting of all of those childhood scenes is warm, right? But then when, when Beth's death does come around as the climax of the whole movie, the lighting is dark. Joe um, remembers the scene from before when her will would save Beth. And she has to submit instead to a will that's greater than her own. And Beth goes and she's left feeling uh, feeling her smallness mm -hmm. and hoping that something will come and fill that space. Mm -hmm. Of course it does, but that even just watching those two scenes get closer and closer together, the way that Greta Gerwig organized it made the, made the theme sing in a way that it didn't mm. in the original. Man, even remembering sense. watching it makes me want to bawl my eyes out. It was awfully good. Oh man, it was so powerful. Yeah. Anyway, all of those, just to, to remind myself what I'm talking about here, all of those things were present in the original story, but they didn't, um, they didn't communicate like they were foils. They didn't show one another up as mm -hmm. repetitions the way that they should have. And I think it's because of the organization. So, so they originally so, so, set them free. So you wouldn't say it's because of the, uh, uh, a fault in the medium. You would say that it's an organizational that, that Greta Gurry came along and reorganized the material chronologically in the order that it's presented to the viewer slash reader. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that, that made it better. Right. right. I what would you're saying is that's interesting. Part, it Go sounds ahead, like Ma. what you're saying is that um, she didn't just improve on a previous movie. She improved on the book. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. That is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And that might be. I don't know. We, Shots we might are fired. Okay, that. I'm just going to issue a quick disclaimer. If you are a listener to this show who loves Little Women and that is offensive to you, we're sorry. Be that as it may. <laughs> <laughs> Come at me, one. I happen to agree. I, I happen to agree. But what are, what are we saying when we say that? And this is not just for Megan. It's for all of you. Yeah. Is such a thing possible? I mean, we already we mentioned the possibility of a bad book being turned into a good movie. We wouldn't call this a bad book. But we all no, no. know cop to calling it a little shallow, maybe a little flat or what well, we, it would be easy for us to admit that uh, a good book, even an American classic can be um, improved upon. The only reason that you would deny that is to say that the author of an American classic is some sort of divine person who cannot be improved upon. Well, I, I don't know. You're treading on thin ice. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> The, the authors write their own stories. And so they are the masters of their own stories. Yeah. But given that, what I will say is when I read Louise Malcott's book, although I enjoyed it very much, I found it um, thin when I taught it. Mm. Like I was striving to um, find deeper themes beyond the theme of growing up and um, that kind of nostalgic loss that, that's associated mm -hmm. with it. How great sisters are. When I, right. well, you know, and I grew up, um, I didn't have sisters until I was an adult. So um, I didn't have that experience in my home life to connect with. I did enjoy reading about it and wished very much that I'd had a bunch of sisters to communicate with like that. Um, so there was that element in the story. But I will say that when, when I watched Greta Gerwig's version of the story, um, the depth 
was, um, was present that was lacking in the story. Mm. I think um, the story di- does have depth, but you have to really meditate on it. Um, you have to meditate on the, the experience in your own life um, right. of loss. Mm-hmm. Because there, there was, although Beth was the only one who died, mm-hmm. um, the childhood itself passed away and all of the relationships between those characters changed when, um, when Meg marries, um, marries John, she doesn't move far away, but she's left in a really real way. And right before the wedding, Joe, um, is begging her in the movie version to please don't, don't go, don't marry him we have our own adventures to have. Why are you going to marry this guy? Stay with me. (laughs) And uh, the response that Meg gives her is, well, because I love him, Uh because I love him. Something has happened inside of her that's irreversible, that's pushing her forward into her future. And that's dragging her sister um, towards the future as well. Um, that, That idea of change that permanently alters relationships um, even when geographic proximity isn't a part of the equation, just really um, moved me dramatically, maybe because of the stage of our own family and the, the leave taking that is happening as all of you have reached adulthood and the final, the final ones kind of finish growing up and point their noses up and out. Um, just watching the relational changes, some of them are really delightful because those um, those mature relationships that I'm watching you have with one another are such a blessing right. to, to witness the changes and the growth as you become one another, not just playmates, but friends, deep mm-hmm. friends. Um, that's been really beautiful to watch, but also painful to There's see, um, mm-hmm. to, to recognize, yeah, to recognize the fact that you're each called um, not only to a vocation, but to um, to a life, you know, in a particular place, having a particular ministry, um, associating with particular friends, going to particular churches and, um, that tight, tightly wound thread that was us is unraveling a little bit being separated Mm -hmm. out like DMC floss, you know, to make another picture. Um, yeah, I found it really, really moving. And Megan and I watched it in preparation for uh, this conversation today, just a couple nights ago. And halfway through the movie, I threw my arms around her and just started weeping. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprised. Oh, go. <laughs> okay. Well, what's, so what's interesting to me, I want to zoom in on this for a second, yeah. because we've been talking um, for years, literally on bibliophiles about what good reading is like and how we're, we're striving to quiet our own minds, hearts, and opinions in order to hear first and respond later and all of that. But it seems to me that um, Gerwig's interpretation of this story is a little bit of a blessing on a reality that we we either tiptoe around or, or don't state super clearly at Center for Lit, which is that um, you actually do have a personalized experience with every book that you encounter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That in oh, yeah. rubbing up against an author's ideas, um, new uh, different fruit is going to be produced from me than it will be from you, Dad, or from you, Emily, because yeah. we bring our own emotional um, carpet bag full of stuff to bear on every book that we interpret. And it just reads like a blessing. This this film reads like a blessing of that kind I like of that. reading and of that reality of encountering a story. Megan, what do you think? I love that, mostly because of the theme of Little Women. I think that it's accurate to the theme, which is, um, as mom was saying, as your family grows up and changes, you're tempted mm-hmm. to see that as destructive, that the thing was perfect when it began, and now its new iteration is always lesser and lesser. Because and different, is, therefore less. Right. Alcott is responding really intentionally to that, and she is arguing your family isn't destroyed by growing It's when it changes, it grows, it gets bigger. Every time one of your sisters gets married, then a husband joins the family and look how that changes the dynamic and look what a blessing John Brooke is. And look how, when Lori marries Amy, now their dynamic is new and professor bear welcome. You know, the idea (laughs) is your your family gets bigger and changes, but change is not bad and be open-minded in the same way. Everyone who reads this story reads it with their own lens and their life experience makes it richer. Um, I think Gerwig is doing one more thing to emphasize that she is sharing with us her modern interpretation of womanhood as well. 
she's bringing in mm. a, a huge conversation about what it is to be a woman. And she puts words in Joe's mouth. My other favorite scene in the story, Joe is talking to her mom in the attic. And she says it's between her refusal of Lori and her getting together with Professor Bear right after Beth has died. And Joe is very much lost. She's turned Lori down. She doesn't know that he's off in Europe wooing Amy. And she's, you know, broken up with Professor Bear because he criticized her work and she can't take it. And she's losing her mind <laughs> with loneliness and grief in at home. And she says to her mother something, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher the scene. I don't have it in front of me, but she says something to the effect of here's what it is to be a woman. Everyone says I'm a heart, but I'm so much more than that. I have a mind and I have ambition and there are all these parts to me. And yet I am so lonely. Mm -hmm. And what do I do with what it is to be a woman, which is all of these things together. There's drive and potential and intelligence and passion and ambition. And at the same time, I'm so lonely. What I feel called to is a husband and a family. It was such a, a refreshing take on womanhood here mm -hmm. in the modern era. And I could hear Greta Gerwig honoring a traditional view of womanhood, even as she brought it into conversation with, with the modern idea of feminism, right? Well, isn't I it think... ambiguous in Go her ahead, movie, uh, whether she actually does end up with Professor Bear, isn't it kind of um, left to us? To... Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Well, the it publisher is. tells yeah. her that the book ends without a marriage and it can't be that way. And so she goes off and writes an ending, which um, leaves us to believe that uh, it's a fiction, that that real Joe does not marry or reconcile with Professor Bear but she fictionalizes an account of that. Wow. Yeah, that's, it's ambiguous in the end. The scene in the rain is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. It's well, left ambiguous for sure. He's yeah. present in the final scene at that birthday party for her Yeah, mother. I was going to say, at the house that she inherits. But, are we, but then, Emily, what you're saying, though, is that we've been experiencing a blending of her real life and right. the book she's writing. It's the novel at that point. You so can't that maybe tell. that's the novel, not the reality. Yep. Because she does Ooh, wow. say to the publisher, he, he demands that there be a marriage. No one will read it unless there's a marriage, he says. Right. I think and so she says, fine, a marriage. I, I like that because of what Megan was saying, that it's both, that she recognizes a portrait of womanhood that is both a uh, heart and head. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more relatable that, yes, Joe feels called to not be lonely and to engage in family life. But what if that wasn't for her? What if? What if he didn't come back? What if, what if Friedrich never returned? Would she be okay? I also think that opens up a whole conversation about uh, the purpose of art because mm. here she is pouring her heart and soul into a novel and that's going to give her identity now. Now she's a published authoress and will that make her happy? And I think that's a whole conversation. On the one hand, that piece of art paused time and captured the life of her little family to save it forever. This mm -hmm. thing that was fleeting, she used her gift to save it. On the mm -hmm. other hand, um, we are all, we're in a certain sense with the publisher. We hope that in the end, she's happy and loved and mm -hmm. with someone, yeah. you know? I thought you were going to talk about that, um, that scene when she takes Beth to the seaside in the movie, Oof. Greta Gerwig's version, they have a conversation and um, Beth is asking her to tell her a story that she's written. And she says, well, I'm not writing anymore because we know the viewers know that she's had that conversation with professor, pro with professor bear and kind of sworn off writing altogether for a time. Uh, so <laughs> she's sucking on a lemon, but Beth says, no, I want one of your old stories. Just tell me a story um, about, just tell, tell me our story. And she says, like, nobody wants to read our story. I mean, it's just like daily life. It's not important. And Beth says something in response, like writing, it makes it important. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a, a really strong artistic statement uh, yeah. coming mm -hmm. through Greta Gerwig's voice here. Uh, the, the fact that Little Women as a book um, is a collection of household scenes, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And there isn't this dramatic, overarching, um, deep, um, action-packed narrative like there would right. be in a present today um, children's novel. Mm -hmm. There's the ordinary humdrum events of these girls as they interact with each other and with the neighbor and with mom and, you know, grow up. It's, it's a very mundane kind of um, series of chapters, but she has a point. Mm -hmm. 
that just like life, um, just like in life, the mundane actually tells a larger story and that when we stop and mark the mundane, write it down, as it were. when we write it down, we make it important. Yeah. And That's now really true. because she has done that generations of women, um, have grown up loving the March family, mm-hmm. wanting to be a member of the March family, as you said, Megan, um, there's a rosy glow around that because she wrote it down. Mm-hmm. She preserved it. You made a comment earlier that we didn't really follow through on, which was that you think that this movie is more interesting to men as well as mm-hmm. women. Mm-hmm. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I don't know that I thought it through all the way to the bottom, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I, we do have I a couple saw of men that it the, was. In the conversation. Yeah, maybe we should punt that to the men. I can guess, but I'm not a man. I know why well, it's interesting to me. Yeah. So dad, go ahead. What did you, what no, did no, you, you go first? Well, you backed, you backed Megan on that. When she said that earlier, you said, I agree. What, what were your, what was your experience of watching this? Well, I think that I wouldn't have known what words to put it in until Megan gave us her little dissertation, which I thought frankly was very compelling. Uh, the idea of Thank Gerwig you. coming in and saying, I know what you were shooting for. Let me help. If yeah. I if I if I switched a couple of things around, I think the thing would really land. And I think maybe my reaction was a uh, reaction based on form and structure, and and based on artistic voice. When I read the novel, I think, oh my goodness, will this ever end? And wait, wait, wait. Have you read the novel? Yeah. When did you read the novel? I read it a couple of years ago in preparation for teaching it. Mm. And I just thought um, that I hadn't, wasn't my first time as my, I think my second time through. And I thought this is, this is a, like you said, a minute ago, Missy, a, um, a didactic, or maybe it was you, right. Megan, a didactic, it was me. bit ponderous, um, you know, you can't necessarily see where it's going, but when you get there, you think all this time, goodness. And, right. and <laughs> I, because of the, maybe because of the kind of things you were saying that you were calling our attention to Megan about Gerwig's adjustments and her reorganizing chronology and giving a, a deeper personal reasons for characters to do things like Lori marrying and that, that sort of thing. Um, I was, I was uh, captivated and it wasn't the least bit ponderous and it would be easy for me to say, well, that's just because I'm I, I want to sit slack jawed in front of a movie rather than do the work of, of reading a novel, but that, I don't think that was it. I, I really do think it, um, the story was, uh, was more active and alive. It was leaner. It was, yeah. uh, it had a depth I think you to had it. to work harder to watch this movie than you did to read that book. Mm, I think you might be right. Ian, you should jump into, but Megan, I think a long time ago when you first watched it, you told me that you thought th- there's a scene Uh, And I think it's towards the end when they're all together and they're all reuniting and all the women are together embracing one another. But off in the corner are John Brooks and Lori and um, uh, the neighbor, Lori's Mm -hmm. uh, guardian, uh, and they're watching them Mm -hmm. and that that's kind of the point that that it's a meditation on on womanhood, but from, but that's open, that's open, right? It's a look, watch observe. Yeah. I, yeah, I forgot that I'd said that, but I do, I do still think that I think also it's seeded in from the beginning because Lori's Lori's whole purpose, both in the book and now even more in the movie is to be an observer, a witness Absolutely. to the March family and to, yeah. to feel the emotion she's hoping to elicit from all of us to look in at that picture that, I mean, the old fashioned, you know, plate in a book of this beautiful scene of all these women sitting around their mother and reading this letter from their dad. He is standing there. Lori's standing in the doorway, Mm -hmm. watching them hustle around and be warm. And the way that Greta Gerwig um, shows us that scene at the beginning, he brings Meg, he helps Joe bring Meg home from a dance because she sprains her ankle or whatever. It's the middle of the night, but that house is alive. All the girls are in their PJs and dancing around and reading books and doing all crazy stuff. And the mother, Marmy, is baking in the middle of the night. And she rushes over sense. to Lori and says, how are your ankles? Have you sprained your, would you like to come in? Can I get you some ice? I like to bake in the middle of the night, please come in. And he says, oh, thank you, ma'am. And she says, not ma'am, I'm mother or Marmy. Right. And it zeroes back in on Lori's face and you get to watch the great Timothy Chalamet experience the emotion of that scene, which is to feel enveloped and welcomed and mm-hmm. to appreciate what a crowd of women does 
which is make make an excess of home where there's ah, room for you. Well you know? said. Yes. Really yeah, I think you're right. Beautiful. She nails the the concept of the woman being the heart of the home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, well, the I think heart, also lifeblood. I'll, I'll jump in and throw my oar here. Is I think that um, she also, and I mean Gerwig, not Louisa May Alcott. Yeah. She also does a great job of understanding what a man's role in all of that is. Hmm. Um, which is you can't say that I don't think of a lot of movies in our era. I think we hmm. gender roles get weird in in popular. American storytelling right now. Um, but in this story, th- it starts there. It starts with Laurie being an observer and and needing something that they have, right? Mm-hmm. He needs the warmth and he needs affirmation and he needs to be, he needs to be mothered. Yes. Um, which is basic human man need. We all need that. We need to be mothered first. And then later on, they all need something that he's bringing to the table, or at, mm-hmm. at least, at least Joe and then uh Amy both absolutely right um joe needs to have the experience of having to tell him no and he needs to experience being told no Mm -hmm. and then amy needs the experience of being pursued by him and um and so it's a coming of age story for him as well whereas he was sort of a cardboard observer in the in the novel so Mm -hmm. i loved i loved it for that reason i i really identified with his character and and thought he was just as much closed in flesh as the rest of them absolutely I loved the scene where Professor Bear comes to the house. Um, she fleshes that out a little bit with the same mm-hmm. kind of um, watching. Mm. Uh, the men standing and watching what's going on. Women are watching too, but they're a little bit more involved and a little more, um, well, they're ahead of the curve. They're seeing this happen <laughs> immediately. Oh, this is the one that Joe loves, right? Um, it, Lori keeps saying, and who are you? Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> who is this? Yeah. <laughs> well, someone tell me who he is. Well, someone, someone tell, tell me, me who, who this is. is. <laughs> but I, I thought that was um, significant. He says, not just I forgot. Funny. He says in the background as they're going to race out after Professor Bear into the rain. Who ever thought that I would get the horses for Joe to chase a man? But I like it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like he it. Does say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope was... that was ad libbed. Man, that guy's funny. Yeah, yeah. I appreciated um, that he was an active spectator in that moment. And the question that he was asking was, um, earnest, Mm -hmm. not an aside, not just who is this? I'm dumb and I'm out of the picture, but I'm at the center of this household. I have been made one of the March children Mm -hmm. and the March family belongs to me. And who are you? Yeah. Why are you you, here? What are you doing here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, What is your relationship with this woman? (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that was, that was beautiful. It's interesting too, that Lori asks that. And yes. her father doesn't. Her father mm-hmm. is conspicuously absent in the book. He actually is not present for, I don't think, any of the events of the story. Um, but Greta Gerwig brings him back mm-hmm. and emphasize, she uses him to emphasize the consequence of his living by his ideals. I think mm-hmm. she that is her attempt to draw in Louisa May Alcott's own father figure and the destructiveness of that transcendental movement on their family culture. The women actually suffered as a result of him thinking only of his ideals and not considering them. And so the father is in the background and not as uh, significant to these women as the next door neighbor or as Lori, who are invested in them and concerned with their well-being. Mm, and it's about relationships. You know? I think I can see that you're right about that. That that isn't that isn't how I read it. Um, I felt like she brought him back into uh, to bless to bless scenes. Hmm. Brought him brought him back into um, because because the the girls themselves and their mother love him. Yes. And oh yeah. Swear by him, and he's present in their minds and their hearts and in their living room at all times. Mm-hmm. And she really took care. I think Gerwig did. Um, to direct the movie so that that was still true. Um, but I, I, I get your point. I think, I think there's two elements. present. Yeah. There. And it could be that what I'm hearing is not just um, a reference to the context, but is also her attempt to deepen Marmy's character. Because one of the things she does for Marmy is introduces that Marmy's not perfect. She's not just the one who delivers the, the preaching sermons at the end of every chapter. And the current buns um, next door. Right. But she's actually this woman who's been struggling to maintain her self-control, even mm-hmm. though she has a temper every bit as strong as Joe's and always has, and is trying to live this life that she chose because of love without her husband. And she's actually, you know, she's hoeing a hard row as it were. 
But then her husband comes back and there's the scene at the dinner table. It's like a happy dinner time scene. And Friedrich is there, Friedrich there. And he's talking about how he's going to go away to California because that's where there are new opportunities and there's new, like fresh ideals there for immigrants in California. And the, it's just a passing comment, but Father March says something to the effect of, maybe I should go to California. Hey, hey, maybe I should go. New idea. And Marmy grabs his hand, slaps it down on the table, and she goes, you're not an immigrant. Maybe you should stay home. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a tiny that little thing, great. but I just think her work of art is deep. And yeah. the more you look, the more there is to see and appreciate. And I, as a lover of Little Women, I thought this was the best version I've ever seen, and I hope they never do it again. <laughs> yeah, this should probably that be was a great. woman train. I don't know if I agree with you that they should never do it again. I, I think that um, the fact that in every generation they want to make it again, um, that that actually puts, um, how, do I, how do I want to say that? I think it justifies its classic status. Mm -hmm. You know, a classic is a book that every generation wants to read again because it's contributing something to the conversation about the great ideas that it's enjoying. Yeah. Um, and it's not, um, it's not a static conversation, but the idea itself is transcendent in such a way that um, every generation comes back to that particular story and says, this one, this right. one needs to be told again. Mm -hmm. We can't lose this one, right? Good point. Some books are written just for their own generation. And they may be very good books and be saying something really important to that particular generation that receives it, but it doesn't last. It's not reprinted over and over again for hundreds of years because it, it was um, speaking into a moment instead of speaking about something um, transcendent and universal. Hmm. Transcendent. That's a good point. Oh. Yeah. Well, transcendent, my, get it? Transcendent, get it? lulz. <laughs> my, um, my, my sort of parting shot, I guess, is that I wouldn't have called Little Women a classic except begrudgingly until I saw this adaptation. Mm. And now I maybe would because I might be with deep. you. I might be with you, Ian. I think that that version of the movie did us uh, did us a great service mm -hmm. by um, introducing us again to Alcott's book and saying, oh, no, no, no. You might have missed it. This was great. Look it was closer. the most intimate. Yeah. I think it was definitely the most intimate portrayal of Alcott's story. Hmm. Well, Megan, thank you. That was really, really compelling. It was so good. It was Thanks. fantastic. Um, Thanks for letting me, you know, get on my hobby horse and ride for a while. <laughs> That's great. That's great. We got to put you up there more often. <laughs> um, it's we, we've kept you over long. Thank you so much for listening to our show. We will be back again in a week or so with more to say about yet another film adaptation of a classic novel. And until then, my friends, happy reading or watching or whatever sort of story consumption you're doing this week. <laughs> we'll see you then. Thank you.